thank you all for inviting me. Uh, as I say, I'm from the IBM's Thomas J. Watson Research Center. Our Global Security Analysis Lab primarily looks at operating system and network penetration issues. Uh, but the particular project I'm talking about is a little, uh, uh, a little side, tri side trip for our, for our lab. Uh, looking at the questions of cryptographic key recovery. Um, so what's crypto key recovery and why do we care about it? Basically, the goal of this project, which was started at the instigation of Lou Gerstner, the CEO of IBM, uh, it's that high a level, uh, was to provide a mechanism for IBM to be able to ex legally export strong cryptography out of the United States. More than 50% of our market is in countries outside the US. And the need for security and cryptography in particular in a large fraction of our products is significantly growing. We needed a way to legally export strong cryptography uh, and not get into trouble with the uh, State Department export control laws for which we could all be sent to jail. And that would spoil our whole day. Basically, the issue is that uh, both the uh, intelligence community and the law enforcement community have been concerned about the unrestricted use of strong cryptography by uh, potentially by hostile nations, by terrorist organizations, and by criminals domestically. And there have been a variety of proposals that have been extremely controversial, uh, most, of, most of them called some form of key escrow system in which the, key, the cryptographic keys are made available to the government upon presentation of court orders or warrants uh, to, to be able to decrypt the communications of someone they suspect of criminal, uh, criminal behavior. Now these have become very controversial proposals because of a wide variety of civil libertarian concerns. Uh, in particular, the systems that have been proposed by the US government, by some of the governments in Europe, uh, and by some companies domestically, while they've provided good access to law enforcement for the data, they have not provided strong enough safeguards against the potential abuse of those cryptographic keys. Uh, the visions of the government setting up a, 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 a society in which everyone is monitored a la George Orwell's 1984, people are very concerned about. And so what we at IBM have tried to do is to develop a scheme that solves both some of the technical problems that have been present in the pr proposals that have come from the US government, from the British government, and from other places, and that tries to better deal with the civil liberties issues so that the key recovery technology can be more acceptable to the general public and can address some of those concerns. Um, and not present such an onerous burden from a civil libertarian perspective. Now the other aspect of this, in addition to providing um, law enforcement access to the cryptography, that is a potential interest in the business community, is the issue of data recovery in case someone loses a cryptographic key. And if you're communicating and you lose your cryptographic key, that's not a very serious problem because Messages are relatively transient, and if you lose your cryptographic key, you can just generate a new one. And if the person who's communicating gets hit by a truck and you can't get the key back at all, um, then you just generate a new one. But on the other hand, if you're using cryptography to provide secure data storage, for example, I have a notebook computer here that I'll be doing the demo on a little later on. Notebook computers are, are notorious for getting stolen. Uh, in airports, um, public transit, all sorts of places. They're high value items, they have a good resale value. And, but if that hard drive contains all of your corporate secrets, um, that would be a bad thing. That's even worse than losing the few thousand dollars that the notebook is worth. The data might be worth hundreds or thousands of times more than that. So you'd like to be able to encrypt the data while it's on the hard drive. But if you've encrypted the data and then tomorrow you forget the cryptographic key, or I get hit by a truck, uh, and the company needs to get the data off, and nobody knows what the cryptographic key is, the data is effectively lost. And so the other thing that a key recovery system can do is provide a means for retrieving data that has been stored for long-term data storage in encrypted form. And that's something that the business community has a legitimate need for 
that's entirely independent of the law enforcement requirements that are generated. Now, the SKR system is quite different from the previously proposed schemes, and, and in particular, SKR is not an escrow scheme uh, in which the keys are actually held by key, key escrow agents, as in the prior government proposals. I'm assuming that most of you have, have seen at least some of, the, some of the discussions in the press and in the technical literature about the Clipper proposals. The, the, the legislation proposed in Congress, it's been, a bit, it's been all in the news. Uh, if there are questions and people want more of the background, uh, after the talk is over, I'll be glad to, to answer questions if you're not totally familiar with that background. Uh, now, the other thing that SKR does that the uh, various key escrow proposals have not done is to pervert, preserve the strength of the user's chosen key exchange mechanism. Some of the proposals, particularly the trusted third party proposal that came out of uh, the Royal Holloway College in England, basically dictated to the customers what their key exchange mechanism was and stored their signature keys in the escrow facility as well as their normal data keys. And that poses a problem. I'll get into more details on this in a couple of slides. Okay. So let's start off with a very brief overview of what SKR is and does. This is the view from 30,000 feet, if you will. And as we go along, we'll get to progressively more technical detail interspersed with motivation for what we're doing. Okay, basically what, uh, what the SKR system does is to provide a means for one application over here to transmit encrypted data to this other application to provide a means for recovering those keys, either when law enforcement presents a court order, or if the legitimate user uh, has lost the key and needs to retrieve it in some fashion. And the way it does that is by taking that encrypted data that's being transmitted and putting two blocks in front of it that we call B1 and B2. B1 is a session independent block that is completely independent of the particular communications that are going on right now. And therefore could be, used, could be generated once and used over, day, over a period of days or weeks. Block B2 is session specific. If, for example, what you're transmitting is an electronic mail message, block B2 is specific to that electronic mail message with that cryptographic key. Uh, if this were a virtual terminal login, uh, block B2 would be constant for the length of that login session. But when you log out and log in again, you'll get a new block B2. On the other hand, block B1 can remain constant for some longer period of time. And basically what happens is the application generates a block B1 and sends it into the key recovery subprocesses, which return uh, a final form of B1, generate a B2, it comes back, and those are attached to the encrypted data. Now, I, I haven't said very much about what's going on in there, Let's just treat it as a black box for the moment. We'll get into the details in a couple of slides. Uh, by the way, if people have questions, feel free to interrupt at any point. And I'll try and keep watching. If you wave it back, it's a little dark. I, hopefully, I'll see you. Uh, OK. Now, what are, the, what are the major properties that are interesting about the SKR system? Now, those blocks B1 and B2 are things that into the prior key escrow systems were typically encrypted under some public key algorithm so that only the key recovery agents could then decrypt them. But public key algorithms are very time consuming. They're typically working with 1,024-bit or 2,048-bit keys. And those algorithms are very time consuming. And we don't want to expend too much additional overhead in doing those public key encryption operations just for key recovery, which is something that many of the customers don't really want to have because the only reason they're doing it is because the government says they have to do it. If not only do they have to do it, but it slows down all their communications, they're going to be doubly unhappy. And so what you'll see in SKR is that we've, we've resolved some of those performance overhead questions. And we've produced a scheme that still has very strong cryptographic properties, but has much nicer performance properties. We've provided a mechanism so, such that the data encrypted under the key recovery agent's public keys 
are independent of the keys that the that SKR is using for itself. So there's no the keys are completely independent, and one key does not reveal any information about other keys. The scheme is also out, completely algorithm independent. The original government proposal for Clipper required an NSA provided cryptographic algorithm, and the details of that cryptographic algorithm were classified. This resulted in a lot of people in the civilian business community being concerned, well, is this algorithm good enough? Are there hidden trapdoors in it? Why should I believe that this is a good algorithm? And why should I particularly pick this one if I already have all kinds of uh, software and hardware set up to use some other algorithm? I'd like to be able to use whatever algorithm I choose. SKR provides you that capability to use any arbitrary cryptographic algorithm of choice. If you want to use an NSA classified algorithm, that's fine. If you want to use triple DES, that's fine. Uh, we really don't care what algorithm you're using to encrypt the data. We also don't, uh, now what we use in fact are a combination of three algorithms in the process. There's a symmetric algorithm, a traditional secret key algorithm that actually encrypts the data. We have a public key algorithm for sharing data between the users and the key recovery agents. And we have some cryptographic hashing algorithms that are used to spread and randomize the bits around in the algorithms. We'll see this in some detail. To ensure that we have very strong cryptographic properties and so that it is so that Mathematically, all of the pieces of the SKR system are extremely difficult to attack. Okay, now I'm going to contrast this with the government's key escrow proposal. This is the Clipper proposal. And then I'll do some comparisons with the trusted third party, the European proposal. In the Clipper proposal, the key escrow agents, the agents who hold these keys and await the delivery of a court order in order to make the keys available to law enforcement, actually hold a copy of the real cryptographic keys. Now in Clipper, those keys are split into two. There are two escrow agents, and those two agents have to combine their keys together. But they have the actual key. And if those key escrow agents by themselves decide to cooperate illegally and abuse the system, they can retrieve the key. In the SKR system, the escrow agents by themselves cannot do that. They have to have law enforcement also cooperate. It requires a three-way party, law enforcement plus two or more key, re key recovery agents. In the government's proposal, whenever you change your keys, you have to send those keys to the escrow agents. That requires communication from the users to the key escrow agents. <coughs> And in a small scale system with a few thousand users, that's not a problem. But if this scheme is to be used for electronic commerce throughout the, throughout the country or the world, they're, they're, that communication with the escrow agents every time you generate a new cryptographic key provides a very significant performance and scalability problem. The amount of traffic that the government proposal would generate would swamp the networks and put a very heavy burden on the key escrow agents to store huge amounts of data. What's more, that huge, those huge amounts of data are extremely sensitive. These are the keys to everybody's cryptographic system. And so not only do they have a lot of data to store, which is hard, they have to store it very, very securely. And that's doubly hard. <coughs> In our scheme, there isn't communication every time you get a new cryptographic key. And the amount of data that's actually stored by the key recovery agents is very small. Very small amounts of data are easier to store securely than very large quantities of data. In the key escrow system, there is a key storage infrastructure that has to be specified and required by the government. You have to do your cryptographic key management in the way the government says you have to do it. And if you're a commercial user and you think that some other scheme is better for whatever set of reasons, you're not allowed to use that. In the SKR system, we do not dictate the key management infrastructure at all. You can pick your favorite key management infrastructure and SKR can be made to work with that. So that, so that the end users have maximum flexibility <coughs> in their choice of algorithms. <coughs> um, we're running low on time. I'm gonna skip over some points. The other critical thing, key escrow, in the Clipper proposal was that once a key was opened up for a, for a 
government wiretap. The key, all uses of that encryption chip were compromised from the first day you had the chip when you bought it from the manufacturer until T equals infinity in the future when you stop using it. Everything is opened up. Well, that's not consistent with federal wiretap law. Federal wiretap law says a warrant says the government is allowed to open up communications from, say, January 1st to March 30th, and that's all. That's what the, what the legislation says in order to limit the possibility of the government uh, setting up an abusive uh, totalitarian regime where it monitors everything a la Big Brother. What, we, what the courts do is they say, yes, law enforcement, you may listen to the communications of that bad guy for this period of time. Yet the Clipper scheme doesn't provide the technical support to actually enforce those civil libertarian restrictions. That's particularly a problem if it turns out that the subject of the government investigation actually was an innocent bystander and, the, and, and, and was not guilty of any criminal action at all. That person's cryptographic keys would have been opened up from the time they bought it to an indefinite time in the future. And because such investigations are normally kept secret by law enforcement, uh, the fact that that innocent person's keys had been opened up by the government uh, wouldn't even be known to that user. And so that has some really nasty civil liberties properties that law enforcement doesn't really have a need for, uh, but they were there and we needed to try and solve those. Now, the other scheme that's been widely proposed is the so-called trusted third party scheme that was developed in Europe. Uh, as I mentioned, at Royal Holloway College in the UK. Trusted third party has some nicer properties than the Clipper, but also has some nasty properties. It has to have, a, in particular, it has to have a copy of the user's private key. Now, the private key in a, in a public key, uh, private key, public key pair, is the key that the user uses to sign things, to authenticate them, to carry out electronic transactions. Under the TTP scheme, not only can the, can the government get access to the information that you're transmitting from point A to point B, the government also gets the necessary information to fraudulently masquerade as you. So if you have a less than ethical law enforcement agent, and of course there never would be such a thing, all policemen are totally 100% honest, uh, but if one of them should happen to be less than 100% honest, this scheme would provide them with sufficient information to masquerade as a user and steal all that person's money. Well, there's no legitimate reason for the police to be able to masquerade as you to sign electronic checks or electronic funds transfer. That's not something that the law provides for. And the scheme that provides key recovery ought to provide a safeguard against <laughs> that sort of abuse by the law enforcement people or by the key recovery agents. They also could, be, could take advantage of this to perform illegal actions. We don't want to allow that to happen. TTP also requires that your key, uh, that your key exchange mechanism be based on the Diffie-Hellman protocol. And the Diffie-Hellman protocol is a fine protocol, and many systems use it. But it is by no means the only key exchange protocol in the world, and it is not the best choice for all possible applications. TTP says that's what you're going to use, period, full stop, uh, nothing else is acceptable. That's not, doesn't make for a good commercial product. That mandates that you have to build things in a particular way that has nothing to do with what law enforcement actually requires. It requires a particular mandated digital signature scheme. It requires the same communication. Every time you change a key, you've got to kind of contact the trusted third parties. So there's all kinds of communications traffic going on, bog bogging down the networks. Okay, so now let's take a slightly closer look at SKR and see why does SKR avoid some of these problems. Basically what we have in SKR is a scheme in which we take a, a, a cryptographic key K that two users generate. Alice and Bob are want to communicate with each other. And they generate two bet random values, a cryptographic key K and a second random value that we call S. S is the S in the SKR system. The cryptographic key K is the K in the SKR system. <coughs> uh, the name Secure Way Key Recovery came later. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. 
Pardon me. I probably grossly overmodulated the videotape, but <laughs> sorry about that. Basically, what the, the SKR system does is it defines two or more key recovery agents for each of the people in the communication. Now, why do we need two or more for each user? Why can't they all use the same key recovery agents? Well, if they're all within a single country, that's just fine. And in fact, there's, there's an existing um, key escort system that uh, is shipped with the Lotus Notes product. The Lotus Notes product takes your 64-bit key, splits it into a 24-bit piece and a 40-bit piece. It encrypts the 24-bit piece with the public key of the National Security Agency, and the user keeps the 40-bit piece a secret. Uh, this means that the NSA has a 40-bit work factor to break the crypto key, whereas everyone else in the world has a 64-bit work factor. And this is approved for export today, and the product is being exported. But this poses a problem in national sovereignty. If um, I have a customer of Lotus Notes in England who's communicating with another customer in Germany, the governments of England and Germany might have a legitimate right to say, hey, why, if they're doing a law enforcement investigation, do they have to go to the US National Security Agency in order to get these cryptographic keys? Um, now, at the moment, we are friendly with those countries, but who knows, in a in hundred years, maybe something would be different. Why should those countries, who are independent, sovereign countries, members of the UN in good standing, have to depend on the US government for that? And they have a legitimate beef there. If the US government had to do the, the inverse and had to go to the, to the British government in order to get the keys, um, they'd be similarly upset. And so what the SKR system does to solve that national sovereignty issue is that each of the two users selects key recovery agents in each country. So key recovery agents one and two are for Alice's country. Key recovery agents three and four are for Bob's country. Alice and Bob being the two people communicating. Now, if Alice and Bob are in the same country, then you can collapse that down to only two key recovery agents and save some performance. Now, the other thing that the Clipper proposal is really where the first, it was first introduced to have two key recovery agents, uh, and therefore compromising a single individual, um, just as we have two men control over nuclear weapons, no single key recovery agent can compromise the system. But again, in SKR, we said, hey, we want to provide maximum safeguards. Suppose the customer doesn't want to just have two key recovery agents. Suppose they want to say, hey, you've got to go to three or four or five, and all three, four, or five of those people have to agree before the key is turned over. SKR provides for that. You can have any number of key recovery agents on either side as you feel like. It's up to the customer. Now, the customer may have to pay a little bit of performance and in signing up with those key recovery agents because you're using more, that may cost a little bit more, but there's no reason why the user should be limited to only having two key recovery agents and not have require the agreement of three or four or five of them before the key is turned over to provide that additional safeguard against the abuse of the system. Okay, so what happens? From the random value of S, we generate a series of what we call KG values, key generator keys. And those keys, KG values, are encrypted under the public keys of each of the key recovery agents. So KG1 is, gener is encrypted under the public key of key recovery agent 1, KG2 under the key, public key of, key of key recovery agent 2, and so on to the total number of key recovery agents employed. Now what we're recommending in a two-country situation is two agents in each country for a total of four. And all of the examples will be worked with a total of four agents. But that could equally well be six agents, or eight, or ten, or however many you want to pay for. Now from that, we generate KK values, which are key encrypting key values, which are then used to encrypt a piece of the cryptographic key. And only when you get all of the KK values recovered from the key recovery agents, can you then reconstruct the actual cryptographic key decrypt the message that's going from Alice and Bob. And those KKs and KGs get stored in those blocks B1 and B2 that we talked about a few slides back. Uh, now, the other interesting piece on this slide is this value R. Now, remember I said in Lotus 
notes, there's a 64-bit key and 40 bits are retained because under current export law, 40-bit cryptography can be exported without restriction. And we wanted to preserve that, uh, this so-called uh, differential work factor, which is what Lotus Notes call it. Uh, the scheme is also called partial key escrow, uh, as it was independently in invented by Adi Shamir at the Technion in Israel. We want to keep this R value, a retained set of bits back, so that when law enforcement retrieves this information from the key recovery agents, they still have to mount a brute force attack on a portion of the key. Now, why do we want to do that? We want R to be swallowed up, so it's practical for law enforcement to mount that brute force attack in a relatively short period of time. But we want to make it large enough so that it's more difficult for law enforcement to do wholesale recovery of thousands or millions of keys. If you're retrieving keys for, say, a thousand criminal investigations per year, doing a brute force attack on R is quite practical. And that's legitimate, and, and those are the sorts of estimates of the number of keys that law enforcement expects to need to recover in any given year. It might be a few hundred or a few thousand at most. On the other hand, if you had an abusive government that was trying to mount a big brother, monitor everything in society, they have to attack millions of keys, or hundreds of millions of crypto keys. And by putting in this brute force attack on R, we raise the cost of doing that wholesale millions of keys recovery, and make that much more expensive and much less practical to be carried out without seriously impacting the cost of doing the legitimate, yes, we have this criminal and this terrorist for whom we have to retrieve a key. So once again, we're maintaining a balance between the legitimate needs of law enforcement while preserving the civil liberties protection against wholesale abuse of the system against society in the, in the, in the large. Okay, question. Is there any, uh, anything taken into account for the fact that probably 10 years of processing will enable that million key uh, encryption thing to happen a lot faster than it does now? Well, in fact, and, and, and that's a very good question because it, it, it opens up a, a two separate but related issues. One is the fact that the, that the value of R wants to be variable over time. Right now, uh, we have the Lotus Notes example in which R is set to 40, and that's been approved by the government. We actually think that 40 is a little small, uh, and we have recommended that we, we'd like to see R at 56. The government has not agreed to that at this point, uh, but we've made the suggestion anyway. Uh, but at 10 years from now, with much faster computers, R should be larger. R should go maybe to 64 bits or to 72 bits. I'm not sure what the value is. The software framework that we've set up allows R to vary. Now, the other reason that we want R to vary is because some countries uh, have more onerous restrictions than the U.S. government. For example, in France, it is illegal to use any form of encryption without explicit government licensing. And they want full access to the keys. That's the law in France. We may not agree with that law in France, but that's the law of the land, that if you don't follow it, you go to jail. Uh, they'll, they'll send you to the Bastille. And that's no fun. So what we've designed is a system that allows R to vary on a per country basis. In this example on this slide, we show an R value being subtracted off because Ellis is in a country that allows you to subtract off an R value. Bob, on the other hand, is in a country where R has to be zero. No amount of, no subtraction of any bits are done on Bob's side because that country doesn't permit that. Now we've designed the scheme so that this still maintains the appropriate level of cryptographic strength. If, for example, you get, you compromise one of the key recovery agents over here on Alice's side and one of the key recovery agents over here on Bob's side, um, the work factor on Alice's side still remains our bits of brute force. Unless you retrieve all of the information on Bob's side, from Bob's key recovery agents, the work factor, even given all of the key recovery information on Alice's side, remains two to the R. And we worked very hard to make sure in the math that that's preserved. Uh, it would be very easy to design a system in which the actual work factor would be significantly less than two to the R. And we went to great stress, great effort, great lengths to make sure that didn't happen.
Okay, I'm going to have to move more quickly because we are running short on time. I'll be available after the talk to go into arbitrary more details. Um, basically, this shows is an overview of exactly what is going into those blocks B1 and B2. Basically, what's created are encrypted, encrypted value copies of the KG values under the public keys of each of the key recovery agents. Together with a field we call T1, which is a public header containing a variety of public information that's needed in order to, to identify who is communicating. It contains the ID numbers of the key recovery agents. When law enforcement receives one of these things, how does it know which key recovery agents to go to? The notion is that maybe lots of key recovery agents in competition with one another, and the user chooses the key recovery agents that he or she wants to use. Well, you need to know which ones are actually in use. So there are uh, jurisdiction IDs, that is the countries that you're communicating. Is this France, or is this Russia, or is this the US? The agent IDs, and the ID numbers of the, of the keys that are being used by the agents. Block B2, the per, the per session block, uh, contains the uh, key encrypting key operations performed on the crypto key minus the R bits, all hashed together with B1 so that they're cryptographically hashed so that you can't split the two blocks apart. I mean, one, of the, one of the possible attacks would be to, to swap V2s from one message to another message and thereby make the messages undecryptable. And by cryptographically hashing them together, we can detect that immediately. Uh, and the hashes use a, a, a good cryptographically strong hash algorithm. We currently recommend the use of, of uh, SHA-1 because uh, some of the other hashing algorithms, such as MD4 and MD5, have turned out to have problems with them. But even there, we don't actually mandate a specific hash algorithm. We've got a framework that says use a good, strong hash algorithm, and as long as you identify what you're using, that's fine. So you can pick your own hash. Question. Um what prevents a bad guy from messing around with the block D1 and therefore preventing uh, someone finding out what agency he used for his keys? What okay. forces that B1 to mess with the message? What forces that B block, the blocks B1 and B2 to be correct is that Bob, Bob's software that implements the key recovery can check that the blocks B1 and B2 are correct. The scheme we have is designed as a, to be software implemented. And if both Alice and Bob attack their software implementations, um, then they can defeat the scheme and, and, and defeat the key escrow. But then Alice and Bob could get some non-key recovery software and use that. On the other, what we've provided in it is a scheme that provides checking so that if only one of Alice and Bob tries to cheat, that they will be detected. If they both try to cheat, there's really no way to stop them. And it's not realistic to try. And at least thus far, um, the government people in law enforcement and at the NSA have basically agreed that that's valid. Once they agreed that you could go from Clipper 1, which was a hardware-only implementation, to a software approach, uh, once they agreed to a software approach, this is the best you can do. Okay. This basically shows how the key recovery agents actually retrieve the data. Um, I'm going to go very quickly because we've only got about 10 minutes left. Now, the scheme we showed, I showed in the previous slides is a scheme that allows you to use any key exchange mechanism you like. And we support that so you can use anything you want. Now, I mentioned that the, 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 the trusted third party proposal required that you use Diffie Hellman. Well, in analyzing our scheme, we discovered that if you happen to choose to use Diffie Hellman, there are a bunch of performance optimizations you can get. And so we are, we are making a recommendation that you use Diffie Hellman. <coughs> and again, there's not enough time to go through the math, so I won't try. But basically, you could get some significant performance gains and reduce the overhead still further if you use a Diffie Hellman key exchange between Alice and Bob and an effective Diffie Hellman key exchange with Charlie. Uh, who represents the key recovery agent. There are actually four different Charlies, one for each key recovery agent. This picture only shows one of them. And you can get some significant performance gains that way. <coughs> but unlike the trusted third party that mandates you must use Diffie-Hellman uh, 
full stop. We merely say, hey, if you would like to use Divi Hellman, you can get some better performance out of it. But there's no requirement. We can provide something that has equivalent security, meets the government's requirements, it just has more performance overhead if you choose to do otherwise. Okay, so what have we achieved with all of this? Well, we've enabled the global use of struct cryptography. We're interoperable with any key exchange mechanism. We work in a multi-jurisdictional framework. Well, I use jurisdiction instead of country because individual corporations might have different rules. For example, for a civil liberties reason, you might want R to be 40 or 56. But if this is data belonging to the Ford Motor Corporation, they might say, that they only want to, they, they're willing to let R be zero because they want to be able to recover lost data on, on, on a, for a lost crypto key very quickly. And so a jurisdiction is a combination of a country plus an application domain, which might be a corporation. Now, the corporation can't make the rules any more liberal than the country's laws, but they can make them more restrictive if they choose to. No limit on key length. Uh, you want to use 7,000 bit cryptography, uh, that, that's fine. The key recovery process will work just fine with that. No algorithm restrictions. Um, there's some other mathematical properties we've achieved. One is that the SKR system preserves perfect forward secrecy. Uh, perfect forward secrecy is a very desirable property on the part of a crypto algorithm. It basically says that recovering one particular cryptographic key gives you no information about past or future crypto keys. The SKR system, when added to a crypto scheme that has perfect forward secrecy, preserves perfect forward secrecy. Of course, if the, algorithm, if the crypto system you're using doesn't have it to begin with, using SKR doesn't give it back to you. Uh, but the important thing is we don't reduce perfect forward secrecy if it's present in the underlying crypto algorithm. We also have a notion of semantic security. The recovery field cannot be used to validate a guess of what the crypto traffic key is. If we weren't careful about this, the fields in the, could, could enable a user to guess cryptographic keys and reduce the key space, key search space. We don't allow that. On the other hand, we do have sufficient validation fields so that when law enforcement is doing its, is doing its brute force attack, we can validate when they have gotten the right key. They don't have to go back and look at the plain text to see if it matches, because the plain text might actually be an object code file. It might be very hard for them to tell. So we do have fields in there so that when they're doing their brute force attack on R, law enforcement can validate when they've got the right R. Uh, but that does not reduce the security if you don't have the values back from all of the key recovery agents. Skip that, skip that, and let's go to the demo. IPsec 
um, IP security protocols that are coming out of the IETF. So this is an example using real protocols with SKR added in using Oakley to provide, which is a Diffie-Hellman based key exchange so that we get those performance gains. Okay, the authenticated key exchange blow uses Diffie-Hellman and, and has the property of perfect forward secrecy. The, the two processes perform mutual authentication. They encrypt all of the user ID values and they encrypt all of the application's data. Now what we're actually using is rather than straight Diffie-Hellman and straight RSA cryptography, we're using the elliptic curve, the new elliptic curve algorithms that provide comparable strength public key cryptography with much smaller key lengths and much better performance than you get with a traditional Diffie-Hellman or with traditional RSA. Uh, we're using 168-bit triple DES to actually encrypt the data fields. We're using uh, the HVAC algorithm for message authentication and integrity. HVAC is an algorithm that was developed at IBM Watson Research as a, as a good message authentication algorithm. And we're using uh, SHA-1, uh, the, the NIST standard for uh, hashing, as the hashing algorithm. So we're using some real algorithms uh, in a much higher security than you typically get in a commercial environment because of the triple debts. Okay. The purpose of the demo is to show that this is real and it can be implemented, and to show in particular what we've done with the blocks B1 and B2 is to provide a caching strategy. Remember I said B1 could apply to many different individual sessions, whereas B2 was specific. Block B1 is where all the public key algorithm operations go on. So what we can do is perform the public key operations once, and then use them for the rest of the day for all of our communication, and only change the B2 operations and the B2 operations all use very fast hashing algorithms, so they have very little performance impact. And then finally, to show that SKR can really be integrated into a state-of-the-art authenticated key exchange protocol uh, using the sort of things that people are talking about right now in the uh, IETF uh, proposed standards. So this is real. Basically, what we're going to do is Uh, Alice and Bob exchange certificates using a standard Diffie-Hellman exchange, g to the x, g to the y. Um, the addition that's different, so the first three message exchanges are the normal exchanges in the Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange that's implemented in Oakley for IPsec. And what we've added are the, are the message exchanges of the SKR block one, or as we, as we also call it, blob one and blob two. When the view graphs were made, the blobs got turned into blocks because that's more respectable for public audiences. But we call them blobs inside of research. Uh, and so the, it's the last exchange of, of the two blobs that, are, that is the addition that from SKR over and above what the normal overhead would be for this encrypted exchange. Okay. Uh, now the results that we've pre-computed, and we'll do the actual demo in a moment, the results uh, that we've measured on a 200 megahertz, um, 686, I think that's actually the AMD processor, uh, 150 megahertz Pentium, and a 7, 75 megahertz 486, show that the key exchange without SKR is respectively 40, 60, and 205 milliseconds. SKR uncached, that is with doing the public key operations every time you do a session, uh, 8 milliseconds, 12 milliseconds, and 48 milliseconds. But if we can cache them, then the incremental cost for each additional session, each additional email message for SKR on the 200 megahertz Pentium is unmeasurable. It's below the, level, the granularity of the clock. For the 150 megahertz Pentium, two milliseconds. For the 75 megahertz, 486, nine milliseconds. So what, what we've measured on other machines is the, the caching provides some real major performance gains. Now the next slide will actually run the algorithm and get the real-time measurements run on a 75 megahertz Pentium. 
The processor in this ThinkPad is roughly halfway between the 75 megahertz 486 and the 150 megahertz 586. So the numbers that we should see, that should be computed, will come out somewhere in between those two values. Uh, the, 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 the two processes have now exchanged hello world in encrypted form, authenticated back and forth, done all of that. Uh, now what the key exchange actually consists of three messages sent in each direction. So three messages from Alice to Bob, three messages back. 100 bytes in each one of those, a total of 100 bytes sent each way. With SKR, there's one additional message, 184 additional bytes sent exactly one way. Uh, and now, should be the one that actually does the work. Did I take a turn? Okay, now we've run the, de the demonstration code. What we see is, is for the first SKR session, the authentication worked, the client and the server authenticated each other, they established secure communications, the session setup time was 145 milliseconds, the blob time was an additional 38 milliseconds for the SKR overhead, total of 183 milliseconds, and the client received 12 bytes. Hello world, it worked. So now we do the whole operation a second time to see the effect of the caching. Uh, the authentication passed, and this time we found a hit in the SKR cache. Uh, so we established secu secure communications, and instead of 145 milliseconds, it's 139 milliseconds. The blob time is, 38 millis is 2 milliseconds instead of 38, total time of 141 milliseconds. Uh, and once again, we received securely and authenticated Hello World, 12 bytes of information. Um, and the control vector technology, when we did this demo, it was in conjunction with another talk, so ignore the first half. Uh, for additional information on the key recovery, that's the web page you can go to on the World Wide Web. Now, are there any other? Yes, there's one other slide I'd like to show and then take questions and let you get to whatever your next commitment is. How do we deal with the countries, the key recovery agents, and the R values? What we have is a global communications table uh, with entries for jurisdictions, uh, for jurisdictions read countries. So X might be the United States, Y might be Britain, Z might be France, whatever. We specify the encryption algorithm in question. Uh, if you're inside that country, uh, how many bits can you keep back? X is the United States, and the Clinton administration still says that domestically, you're not required to use key recovery. You can use anything you want domestically. Uh, so we can use infinite bits of key length. Uh, when we're going outside the US, let's say that the value of R mandated by the government is 40 bits, and the maximum key size might be 64 bits. And here are the public keys of the various key recovery agents. We show two, but if, there, if we develop a competitive business, there might be dozens or even hundreds of key recovery agents that the user could choose between. Now, in some other countries, say country W, which might be, say, France, uh, you're not allowed to use encryption with key recover, without key recovery domestically. And the value of R is zero. And the maximum uh, key size that they allow is 128 bits. Now, what we argue is that the maximum key size with key recovery could be infinite. But we try to recognize at the table that not all governments will go along with that idea. And so we provide enough <coughs> capability so that we can implement whatever the laws are in each country that we sell the product to. Now, the table itself would be digitally signed so that the software knows that this is a legitimate table. Now, it periodically gets updated because countries change their laws. New key recovery agents uh, appear. They go into business. Other key recovery agents may go out of business. So that the updates to the global communications table could be made from a, a standard site on the World Wide Web. And as long as they were digitally signed and the SKR implementations check those digital signatures to know that this is a legitimate update to the global communications table. <coughs> so we can ship an initial 
up with the product, and then the customer can get updates at his leisure. Questions, comments, um, so, sir. Just clarify what <coughs> the government did to, to figure out the key. They need all of the okay. keys, right? When the government needs to get to retrieve a key, they they first have to get permission from the court to conduct a wiretap. They conduct the wiretap, they look in the head, in the, the B1 and B2 fields to find out how many key recovery agents and what are their names. They then go to the key recovery agents in sequence and present to them the, map, the values in blocks B1 and B2. Each key recovery agent performs a mathematical transformer and returns some other values to the government. Those values are not cryptographic keys, those are just other intermediate values. The government then takes all of those values, performs an additional mathematical transform to combine them together to get the bits of the key that they are allowed to retrieve. Then if there is an R value, they then do a brute force attack on those R bits, performing on the average 2 to the R over 2, because on the average you'll get it halfway through. Uh, trial operations to find out what the final value is. And now they have a cryptographic key that can recrypt the data that they obtained in the wiretap. Right. The key recovery agents are only, of course, before they perform those computations, want to see the, the court order or the warrant from the government, and they want to verify that the dates and times match. In those block, key recovery header blocks are, are timestamps of when the transmission actually occurs, so that the key recovery agent can ensure that they are only returning, retrieving keys that are within the specified time period of the court order. Um, as our government said, we'd really like to limit the number of uh, recovery agents to 10 because if you go higher than that, they have to do a lot of extra work and start covering the people. We haven't heard that comment from them. They've been more concerned about the value of R. Uh, as a practical matter, there's a natural limiting on the number of key recovery agents because that increases your overhead. And we don't expect people are going to go for very many. Um, and of course, the key recovery agents have to be legitimate agents that the government that, that the government has, has in some sense approved. Um, other questions? I've gone through a lot of material in her, so if people want to discuss either more of the political background that there wasn't time for, or go into more of the math within the limits. I'm more of an, I'm actually an operating systems person, not a cryptographer, so I could only go so far on the mathematics. Um, my view was, my part, my contribution to this was more looking at the ways to attack it, the ways that things could be abused, to find out the places where we had to put in safeguards. The math, I, uh, I quickly gets over my, my limited abilities. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.